Nobody wanted it. My team didn't want it. My family didn't want it. They were pissed. Brown team didn't want it. No one wanted that to happen. The game of basketball didn't want to happen. So I made sure I linked myself with Brian even more because I knew we had to be so tight but or it was going to be a failure. Dwayne Wade talking about the big three and how it seemed like nobody really wanted it to happen. In fact, under a lot of pressure, but instead of having a rift, it grew them bonded closer together. Do you really believe the NBA didn't want it to happen, though? I thought it was great for the NBA. No. The NBA did not want it to happen. I would think it's great. It was awesome. Everyone no, loved because it. because nobody likes super teams because they, they felt like the, the shift of balance um, would have gone towards the heat. It is an organizational change. And it would change the dynamics of how um, franchise players may... St- Listen, it changed... The league probably didn't want it because of the power. Now the power went to the players. Think about it. They formed, they got together, how everybody knew how they, this all was, how this all began. They were the Olympic, Olympic team. They talked. They discussed them among, I think it was four of them, because I think Carmelo was also included. Remember mm-hmm. Carmelo? I think Carmelo was supposed to be the third player from the big three. It was originally Carmelo, then it so happened to be Bosch. Melo wanted the money, so Melo signed a deal with Denver that he got an extra year and extra money. So he wasn't going to be able to become a free agent that summer of 2010. Bosch deal with Toronto was going to allow him to be able to become a free agent in 2010. The league did not want that to happen because that started the player movement, the power to where the player had the power to, to dictate where they would like their career to go. So that's the real issue. The WNBA, the WNBA, the NBA did not want it because they did not want to cede power. And one that they were worried that there was just going to go try to, everybody's going to try to build a super team and there was only going to be like three or four super teams and they were just going to go at it. No, they didn't want to give up the power. And they ended up lo- losing a lot of the power because we know the players in the NBA have more power than most of the other leagues. Well, yeah, because they put asses in the seats and they, sell, they help sell, sell merch and everything like that. The other reason why you saw the deal that the um that uh they just signed with um all those media companies to now broadcast the NBA now on the NBC network Peacock mm-hmm. obviously ABC ESPN Disney and um now what with Cinemax and all these other apps are involved yeah there's so much money because of what the players and what the player movement has as a uh, has done for the league. So they didn't want that to happen because you have three, you, you want comp- competition. You want, uh, what's the word? They, uh, what they want, uh, they want parody. parody. They wanted parody. But if you have, so if Chris Bosch leave Toronto's not the same market, at, uh, with Chris, ba- without Chris Bosch as it is with Chris Bosch. And obviously Cleveland, right? Cleveland, like you know, you did a lot because you want to have that small market. They all, cause the small market, they're always a narrative of be- is between big markets and small markets that the league always wants the cities like New York, Miami, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia to be on because they're the big markets, more viewers, more ratings. Kudos and, though. Go ahead. Um, yeah. But then the small markets like Cleveland, the Oklahoma cities, New Orleans, New Orleans. Eh, yeah, New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans is a city, but I guess, okay, fine. In, in this case, it's a small market, but I'm looking at like the Sacramento, the, the OKC, Portland, Portland, those type markets, because when they have a player, they draft and the player becomes a superstar. The, oh, the narrative is that the superstar, especially if they got a shoe deal or you see them in many commercials to get more exposure, they're going to go to the biggest market. And when you have a player like LeBron, who was from Cleveland, drafted by the Cavaliers, and it was the biggest name in the sport or one of the top three biggest names in the sports, it was great to say, hey, look, small market team, competitive, homegrown talent, all of this. But if he goes to a city like Miami, Chicago, New York, and L.A., the, the big city narrative happens, and then you get what you get. And that's what happened. You, I mean, they went to a beautiful city, and they, they went to Miami. Miami was it. Miami was the city that everybody wanted to go to to watch the big three play, to come re- to watch a game at that, you know, when it was at the Kaseya Center. But, you know, the previous names that had be- before at the time with the American Airlines Arena. Yeah, it was a happening place. And they're still living from the fruits of that. Now. Yeah, it changed the organization forever. Kudos, though, to Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosch, 
LeBron James, the other guys on the team, Eric Spolstra, Pat Riley, the Heat organization. The thought is and was put them together easy. It's a championship. It's a win. It's done. We've seen that super teams don't always just win championships. We've seen a couple of them pop up here and there where people are like, whoa, they're loaded. They're stacked. They've got everybody. And they don't always win it. So you hear from Dwayne Wade saying, we just had to bind ourselves even tighter together. We knew it wasn't going to be easy. We knew there was going to be a lot of pressure. The way the Heat handled that situation, and I know you say, well, I mean, if I had three of the best players in the league, I'd win championships too. But like I said, it's not a given. And then they only won two out of four, by the way, too. It's not that easy. So I think some kudos need to be given to the players and the organization for um, making it work. It's a great interview if you watch it. It's on it's on YouTube, 7 p.m. in Brooklyn, the Carmelo Anthony and um uh, that boy Merrill uh podcast and they have Dwayne Wade on there and it's a great interview because he um Melo's probably the best play person that can explain Dwayne Wade's game and his importance to the league and he gave D Wade his flowers because uh Wade had success earlier than any of those guys because the minute he was drafted by the Heat and went to the playoff his first year won a won a series got eliminated what in the second round mm -hmm. then the second season they got Shaq then they got to the Eastern Conference Finals, and in the following year, they went. They won the championships. So he he became successful very early, and Wade Wade County, all the accolades he got that early, but he realized he couldn't win a championship by himself anymore. So he sacrificed. Remember, he played well in that 2011 NBA Finals. So it was Bron that didn't play well, and then the injury started catching up to D Wade, but he was able to put his ego to the side and adjust his game and he's adjusted his game many times for the betterment of a team for the team so that was a great interview um they, that was a great part of the interview they also talked about um um his his dealings with Shaq and how Shaq got him motivated to win the 2006 NBA finals when <laughs> Shaq was like I'm getting a triple team and he was like uh, Shaq, you're not getting triple team. You're just, you know, you're not the same Shaq anymore, but I can see it. Reverse psychology, it worked. And uh, yeah. And oh, heat culture. He also talked about heat culture that one time he, he saw Carmelo practicing with the Denver Nuggets and Melo was like, what up, D-Wade? And he couldn't say hello to Carmelo because that was in heat culture. You can't say hi to the opposition or anything like that. Uh, but it was a good story because Carmelo looked like he was partying the night before. So him saying him saying what up to D Wade and D Wade answering with Riley there. Riley would have assumed that D Wade was partying with those guys the night before. So he didn't say anything, but he called them right after practice to say, Hey man, my bad. Not saying hello to you, man, but this is heat culture. You can't say hello. You can't fraternize with the opposition right before the game. It's a good interview. Good interview. Hmm. I don't know. LeBron did some fraternizing in games and stuff with other players when he was here with the Miami Heat. I remember this that was early. This was early. Oh, okay. This was early in uh, D Wade's career. This is when you know he was a rookie. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you can't you can't play around when you're a rookie and stuff like that. No, but... no, you're learning heat culture. You didn't know it at the time. But He's yeah, learning it. You, if you are around other basketball teams, and I know probably most people in South Florida have either lived here their whole lives or haven't been around other basketball teams. The Heat are a much tighter ship than most other teams that I've been around as far as the way they conduct themselves, their rules, and the stuff they do. So when people do say Heat culture, it is a real thing. It is a thing that they make a conscious effort to have. It's not just something that happens. It is actually a conscious effort that these teams are making, that these guys are making, and that surrounds this team. And maybe you do need it in a place like South Florida because there are a lot of ways to be distracted. And if you let the distractions get to you, as we know, some teams, those distractions of their cities do get to them. But here you got to really kind of reel it in and keep people on a short leash because there's just way too much temptation. But big three, always love hearing about them. Always love hearing about the kind of behind the scenes, like you said, uh, Dwayne Wade telling about heat culture and how they really bonded together. And Eric Spolster, man, I'll say this at the time when Eric Spolster got the job, I didn't know much about him like most people and thought, oh, he's just a puppet coach, you know, and just using him to, you know, take some bullets. And he's ended up being, if not the best coach in the league right now, one of the best coaches in the league and a Hall of Famer at that. So he has been more than just the big three. He has proven it. So the Heat organization, kudos to them for making the big three happen, making it work. And of course, building off the success of that, because be honest, Big three doesn't happen. This heat organization is vastly different today. I mean, yeah. vastly. 
I don't want to hear, no, I would still be right there. No, you, it'd be vastly different. That's why you can hear, let's go heat chants all over the country. It's not because there's heat fans all over the country. It's because of the big three and everything that has stemmed from that 